Returning from the thicket of the African jungle, where I was in another hot spot, no sooner had my plane landed than I tried to call Vera. I couldn't wait to tell my wife that I was already home and that I would see her soon. But her cell phone didn't answer, so I called her at work. Her secretary answered the phone. Hello, Chief Medical Officer's office. Can I help you? An unfamiliar voice sounded in the receiver. Hello, can I hear Vera? I asked politely. Vera's not at work. Who's calling and what can I tell her? The receptionist was as polite as I was. It's her husband. I really need to see her. Do you have any idea where she might be? The secretary was silent for a while, as if gathering her thoughts. Then she hummed and said, If this is a joke, it's a very bad one. And without saying goodbye, she hung up. I stood there for a few minutes, unable to collect my thoughts. It was crazy. I took a cab and drove home. I opened the door and walked into our apartment. I had the impression that no one lived here. I ran my hand across the kitchen table. Dust gathered on my finger. The situation was becoming more and more incomprehensible. I made my way to my room and took off my uniform. I wondered where my wife was. I called my daughter. Her phone was disconnected too. Where are they? I rinsed off in the shower and changed. He pulled a bottle of whiskey out of his duffel bag and poured half a teacup. I didn't understand anything yet. After half an hour, I dressed more or less decently and called a cab. I decided to go to Vera's place of work and do some reconnaissance. Mingling with the crowd of patients, I sneaked past the guards and made my way to the reception desk. Two young women were loudly discussing the upcoming New Year's corporate party which was to be held today in the restaurant of the Hotel Plaza. I listened. The girls were talking nonsense for a long time until they announced the start time. 6 Gaur p.m. sharp. For some reason, I really wanted to attend this event. I was not surprised to see a sign on the door announcing that the restaurant was closed for the event. I've been here several times before with my wife and with friends. The restaurant has separate dining rooms and assumed the party was being held in one of them. The big man blocking the doorway looked at me suspiciously. Do you have an invitation? Oh shit. I tried my wife again, but her phone was still disconnected. I turned to the man in the doorway. Listen to this. It's a corporate event for the regional medical center. My wife's supposed to be there. I just flew in today and I can't get her on the phone. Her name is Vera. She's definitely here. I tried to explain. The guard shook his head. Entry is by invitation only. I have strict guidelines, no invitation, no entry. I can't do anything. And you can just give her a message that I'm here. I tried to keep my cool and not to pounce. I could see that the guard was hesitating. Then he said something into a microphone sticking out of his breast pocket. A few minutes later, the door opened and a young woman I didn't know came out and gave me a scrutinizing look. I repeated to her what I had said to the guard. Can you confirm that you are Vera's husband? I threw a surprised look at her. Of course I can. Who are you? I fumbled in my pocket and handed her my passport. I am Angelica, her personal assistant. The stranger answered, scrutinizing the document. Check the marriage stamp, I prompted her. She checked it looked at the guest list on her phone and gave me a confused look. Faith is here, she stammered for a moment, with her husband and daughter. I stood there as if stunned. A thousand bells rang in my head. Husband? I whispered. Who am I then? The woman shrugged. Another guard loomed behind her. I'll let you through, but I hope you don't do anything stupid. The woman turned to the guards. Let him through. As he passed, he heard Angelica say softly to the guard, Keep an eye on him. From behind the closed double doors on the far side of the fay came the sounds of music. I threw off my jacket in the check room and went into the hall. The large banquet hall of the restaurant was decorated in New Year's style. In the middle stood a large Christmas tree, decorated with toys and lighted garlands, with its top pointing to the ceiling. Tables were pushed to one side of the room, leaving room for couples dancing in front of a low stage. A live band was playing on it, which was the source of the music. Apparently there was a break and people were partying on the dance floor. 
It was as if I were scanning the dimly lit hall. Vera was nowhere to be found. Suddenly, I saw the HR deputy who worked with Vera. I knew him. He had been to our company several times. I approached him and politely took him under the elbow. Hey, Sanchez, do you know where Vera is? I asked, blaring the music. He threw me a shocked look. Don't worry, she's fine, he said. But as he spoke, there was something in the way his gaze darted around the room that made me nervous. Then he gestured toward the far end of the room. I went there, carefully making my way between the dancers. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw that Sanchez continued to stare at me dumbfounded. Vera, dressed in a short burgundy dress, stood surrounded by men. Next to her, in a chic tuxedo, stood an imposing, flouncy man. With a look of possessiveness, he supported her with one hand at her elbow, the other discreetly stroking her ass. Next to her stood our daughter Madonna. They were discussing something cheerfully and laughing from time to time. I came almost close and asked loudly, Vera, what's going on here? She slowly turned toward me. Enrique. From where she had spoken and, without speaking, she fainted into the arms of the man standing behind her. I shifted my gaze to my daughter and shuddered at her icy coldness. Help me, Vera's not well. She needs to be moved to the restroom. Vera's boyfriend carried her toward the door. I didn't understand a thing. Wait a minute. That's my wife, get your hands off her. I took a step toward the man holding Vera. He flinched when he heard the anger in my voice. Angelica, standing nearby, gave me a startled look. She touched her finger to the walkie-talkie. Wait, I looked at her. Who is this man? Why is he pawing my wife with his hands? But no one answered my questions. Everyone, including my daughter, stood and looked at me in silence. Why is he still here? Where are the guards? The man was already yelling. I froze in place. I wanted to go to Vera, to help her, to tell her that I loved her, that I never stopped thinking about her for a second, but I couldn't get my legs to obey. But the other half of my brain, at the same time, was thinking about who was next to my wife now, how far their relationship had gone. I turned to my daughter. Madonna, can you explain? Madonna looked at me with ill-concealed contempt and anger. You've ruined everything. She turned away. She didn't even say, Daddy. I was taken under my arms by the guards who had arrived. I saw the unconscious Vera being carried out of the hall. The picture in my eyes began to blur. It was clear that I was getting nowhere. I could send half of those present, including the guards, to the hospital, and I would probably end up behind bars then I wouldn't know what had happened. I threw up my hands and walked away without looking back. The whole situation was strange and clearly out of control. My jacket, I said sharply to the woman behind the coat check counter. While I waited for her to bring it, the door opened behind me. I turned around, still hoping for something. But there stood the freak who'd been with Vera, a contemptuous smirk on his face. You've lost, warrior. Vera and her daughter know I'm the best choice for them. I growled and stepped toward him, shaking my fists. But I was stopped by the big hand of the guard standing between us. I'm sorry, but I have orders. You must leave, he said. And you? He jabbed a finger at the entrusted companion who stepped back and stood in the open doorway. Please return to the hall. Grabbing my jacket, I made my way to the front door and ducked into the chill of the December night. The guard watched me closely as I hailed a cab. I was still holding out hope that the door behind me would open and mine, my wife and daughter, would rush after me. A yellow cab pulled up to the curb. Climbing into the back seat, I gave the address. I had to get my things because I didn't want to stay in that apartment. I asked the driver to wait, quickly went up to the apartment and collected my stuff. For a long time I looked at our wedding photo, which was covered with a thin layer of dust. Then I sighed and slammed the door, leaving my past life behind me. Now to look for shelter, probably have to rent something. I got on my phone again. There were plenty of places to live. I searched the classifieds and found a suitable option. 
For a relatively small amount of money, there was a small one-room apartment in the old part of town. I dialed the number. The small two-story red brick house with a red painted roof resembled a fairy tale gnome. It was squeezed from two sides by five-story paneled buildings. The five-story buildings blocked the sunlight, and during the day, the house was always in the shade. That must have been why the price was relatively low. There were only four apartments in the house. In front of the front entrance, there had once been a small garden, but now there were only stalks of last year's weeds sticking out of the snow. The landlady met me on the porch. We said hello. An elderly woman invited me to go up to the second floor. It's my grandfather's apartment, and we've wanted to sell it for a long time. But he flatly refused to move out, he said only after his death. We took his things out, only the furniture was left. It's old, but you need something to eat and sleep on. The landlady opened the door and turned on the light. I entered the wood-paneled hallway. The door to the only room was open. There was an old sofa with a broken leg, and a few books in its place. There had once been paintings on all the walls, even in the kitchen. Now, in their place, there were nails hammered into the wall and rectangles of wallpaper that hadn't faded. An old seven-string guitar hung on the wall, adorned with a blue silk bow. Grandpa was playing around a bit. Intercepting my gaze, the hostess said. I stepped closer and ran my fingers over the strings. There was the rattling sound of a distressed instrument. I was satisfied. The hostess took the money and disappeared. I was hungry, so despite my fatigue, I had to go shopping for food and drink. I closed the door, walked down the street, and went to the supermarket, which was not far away, on the same street. After walking around the sales floor, I loaded the cart with groceries, paid, and rolled it to the counter. I took out a bag, reached for the cart, intending to transfer the groceries, and came face to face with a homeless man. I wanted to chase him away, but for some reason I felt sorry for him and even gave him a few bills. To my surprise, I saw that it was a woman. I took the bag and leisurely headed towards my temporary shelter. I forgot about the homeless woman instantly. I reached home just as the snow began to fall in earnest. Finally, I sat down on the old, worn leather couch and closed my eyes. Thoughts attacked my brain. What had happened? Why was the daughter talking to me like that? And the wife, her fainting when she saw me. It looked like I wasn't expected and had been debited from all my accounts. My credit card was maxed out. At least there wasn't a problem. But the rest of it was a mess. I decided not to make a fuss and not to beat myself up for nothing. Everything would be resolved sooner or later. But one thing I was sure of, it would never be the same. I must have dozed off, because I was awakened by the sound of something coming from the front door. I cautiously peeked out of the room. Someone was trying to open the front door, but the key sticking out of the keyhole on my side was in the way, and when I realized that the lock wouldn't open, I fell silent. I stood up and listened. It was quiet outside the door. You can't hide from problems. You have to solve them. I went to the door, turned the key, and jerked the handle toward me. It was half dark on the landing. The light bulb, which was dimly lit by a fly-infested bulb, could not fully illuminate the landing. I turned my head. The homeless woman I had seen outside the supermarket was looking at me fearfully. This woman seemed to be as hard to get rid of as a cockroach. Why was she here? Was she following me or something? We stared at each other in silence until the door slammed downstairs. She ran in here. Stay downstairs, and I'll go upstairs and look. Someone shone a flashlight up the stairs, the police. That's all I needed right now. I grabbed the homeless woman by her dirty collar and pushed her into the apartment. Careful not to make any noise, I closed the door and turned the key. I turned to the woman and put my finger to my lips. A voice came from outside the door. There's no one here, and the attic is locked. All right, let's go. She's not going anywhere. She'll be caught sooner or later. I heard heavy footsteps clattering up the stairs. The door slammed. I looked cautiously out the window. A police car with its blue lights on was pulling away from the house. 
You can stay as long as the cops are around, I said. Then get out of here. Thank you, she said quietly. Look, I don't want to offend you, but you're dirty as a sack of potatoes and you stink. There's a bathroom over there. Go and wash up. Saying that made me feel sick. Good Samaritan. Maybe she's sick. Maybe she's lousy. That's the only thing I need to be happy about right now. Throw her out and be done with it. What about the police? All right, she'll wash up and out the door. But there was something else keeping me from kicking her out. Maybe the feeling that I was as homeless as she was, only with pockets full of money. Without a word, the woman went to the bathroom. A few moments later, I heard the shower running. I went into the room and pulled a towel out of my duffel bag. Then I opened the bathroom door, expecting the shower curtain to be closed. She was standing in a very deep cast iron tub with the shower on full blast, fiercely washing the dirt off of herself. She stood with her back to me and drank. I was amazed. It was like a work of art. It reminded me of a painting of Europe emerging from the sea. The woman's skin was a pale, milky color as she washed away the dirt and grime. His washed-out hair fell in a white wave down his back, ending at his waist. Several fresh bruises and bruises were visible on her back. Her legs seemed very long. Her hips were narrow and her ass was nicely shaped. I had the idea that if I shoved a few meals into her, her ass would be impressive. The stranger seemed to sense my gaze and turned around. I saw her breasts. They were not very large, but they were very appetizing. The woman blushed and stared at me absent-mindedly. She stood without making any attempt to cover herself. I can continue. Did you see everything you wanted to see? She asked a little angrily. Are you a pervert by any chance? No, I just brought a towel. I said, and I felt myself getting angry too. No one asked you to come here. You can leave any minute. I shoved a pile of dirty clothes in her direction with my foot squeamishly. Wait, she said, and lowered her arms, fully exposing her body, and added doomily. Look, if you like. I wasn't going to stare at you, I said conciliatorily. I knocked, but you didn't hear. I hung up the towel. Then why were you standing there looking at me? She asked. Probably because I'm a normal man, I said. When we see naked women, we get dumb. But I'm dirty and ugly, she began. And I'm blind, I said. So I'll just take your dirty rags and get you a tracksuit. Walking out of the bathroom, I sighed heavily. I needed to get out of this room before she noticed how hard my little friend was. I hadn't had any women during my time on my business trip. I knew that beautiful women were like an expensive car. They're nice to look at, you can think about them, but only theoretically. Beautiful women are too expensive, overly complicated to operate, and completely unreliable to mess with. Especially since I was married. I closed the door, I stuffed the dirty, smelly clothes into a garbage bag and put them in the stairwell. Then I went back to my room and pulled out my tracksuit. It's going to be a little big for her. But that's okay. It'll do for the first time. And then I caught myself thinking, for the first time, am I going to keep her overnight? A strange woman. Where would I put her? There's only one bed. The other half of my brain was whispering. And where to put her? out in the cold. Again, the police. Let her hang out till morning, then out the door, and at night you can sleep in a chair. I looked out the window. The snowfall intensified. Snowflakes covered the street and the roofs of the houses. Okay, let it stay until morning. The door creaked open, and a woman dressed in my tracksuit entered the room. She'd tucked the sleeves and pants, but it still hung on her like a hanger. Is the police car still there, or have they left? She asked. Looks like they're gone, but I don't know how far. Maybe they just turned off their blinkers and hid. I figured I'd spread a little fear. But you can't leave yet because I threw away your stinking rags. What am I supposed to do now? She said helplessly. I have nothing else to wear. Stay until tomorrow. I'll give you some warm clothes and you can go wherever you want, I answered. What am I supposed to do until tomorrow? She looked at me fearfully. Let's go to the kitchen. First of all, the guest needs to be fed, 
She followed me into the kitchen and looked around. I opened the refrigerator and she sighed sorrowfully. I see, it's been a long time since she's had a proper meal. I took out the sausage and the canned meat I'd brought with me. I carefully placed the tray of eggs on the table. In a minute, a cast iron frying pan was churning scrambled eggs on lard and an open can of stew was warming. I sliced the bread coarsely, military style, with my tactical knife and put the food on a large plate. Then I took a bag of birch juice out of the refrigerator and poured it into a large glass. Bon appétit. I put my fork in front of her. I'm sorry, is there a knife? She asked guiltily. I silently put the table knife next to her plate. She pounced on the food as if she hadn't eaten in a long time. Well, I'll leave you to it. I went back to my room. I wanted to smoke, so I went out to the stairwell. I caught myself thinking that I kept waiting for a call from Vera. She knows my cell phone number perfectly well, doesn't she? I pulled out my cell phone. Oh shit. It's dead. I had a thought. Maybe she already called. I'd have to put the phone on the charger right away. When I returned to the room, the woman was sitting on the floor with her legs tucked under her. I looked at her in surprise. Why don't you have a seat on the couch? I didn't know how you'd feel about me sitting on your furniture, she said. I shrugged, snatched the comforter and pillow off the bed and threw it on the couch. Go lie down. Thank you. She smiled. I decided to let her sleep until she woke up. I looked at my cell phone. It was almost charged. I turned the phone on. Several missed calls and texts from an unknown number. I opened the first one. An hour after I left the corporate retreat. Enrique, we need to talk. Enrique, where are you? There's been a terrible mistake. We need to talk now. Enrique, don't be silent. We have to meet. I'm going crazy. It goes on like that. I think it's Vera's new number. I looked at the clock. Half past three in the morning. It was answered right away. I knew Vera's voice well. Hello, Vera. Spasms clutched my throat. Enrique. There's been a terrible mistake. They told me you were dead six months ago. I saw the paperwork. You burned up in a helicopter that was shot down and your body was never found. That's what they told me at the military recruiting office. That's why there was no funeral. The enlistment office told you, really. I was shocked. Yes, and they showed a telegram from your unit. Vera was crying into the phone. I got sick and went to the hospital. So bad for getting married so quickly, huh? My heart ached. Enrique, I was sick. Danilo helped me through this grief and supported me. She was already sobbing. We must meet. I'll explain everything. Where are you now? With a secret hope, I asked. I live outside the city, in Danilo's cottage. Madonna lives with us. Come to our apartment tomorrow. I didn't change the locks. Vera sobbed. I'll be there in the morning. I love you. I wanted to ask her about her daughter, but my heart was already aching unbearably. I'll call you back tomorrow. I disconnected. So this smug asshole's name is Danilo. Okay, I'll wait till morning. I went back to the room. The woman was awake and sitting with her legs tucked up. I looked at her. I knew she wanted to ask me something. I also knew it would be hard for her to do so. You can stay until morning. I'll give you some warm clothes and you can leave. I already told you that. Only until morning? She asked quietly. I was silent for a long time. It could be longer, I said slowly, but I'm afraid you'd hate me for it. Do you want me to sleep on the floor or in the kitchen? Or are you afraid I'll get in your way? A glimmer of hope flickered in her eyes. I want you to sleep with me. My mouth is dry, in my bed. I'll pay you. She wanted to say something, but then she put her hand over her mouth. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said that. But I think about you all the time. That's impossible. She moved gingerly to the edge of the couch. I'm homeless, but I'm not a whore. I'm sorry, I may have overreacted. It's just that I haven't had a woman in a long time, a long time. There was a pause. I was a little angry at her refusal. The usual male lust kicked in. 
I'll do it suddenly, she said. If you let me stay a few days, you can fuck me. But you can't kick me out if things don't go the way you expect. I'm not a prostitute. Except when I've been raped, I haven't done it in a long time, she said doomedly. She looked me straight in the eye, and I felt like the biggest, most heartless bastard in the world. Two long tracks of tears ran down her face, and every word sounded like it was carved from her very soul. Don't. Stay on the couch or move to the bed if you want, I said. I really, really wanted a woman. After the twists of fate of today, I just wanted to forget myself. The only cure was either vodka or sex. I wanted someone to take pity on me, to say an affectionate word, even if it was fake and corrupt. Yeah, I guess I'm not much of a scumbag. In the short time I had her, my perception of life had changed. An uninvited guest became a person to me, and no matter how I felt about women, it was nice to have her around. Now there was no way I was going to send her back out on the street. I stood at the window and watched the snow fall. Okay, it's way past my bedtime. I turned around and froze in place. She was standing naked and staring at me. I picked her up in my arms and gently placed her on the bed. My name is Miranda, she whispered before giving herself away. When we were done and I leaned back, she looked up at me. Tell me, if I were ugly, would you want me or not? There were tears in her eyes, but there was no anger in her voice. She seemed completely resigned to her fate. The missile hit the port side. Instantly, the contact fuse went off, and the steel dragonfly turned into a shapeless ball of fire, tearing human bodies to shreds. I awoke to my own scream. I sat on the edge of the bed, and gradually the events of yesterday began to fill my brain. I turned my head. Miranda wasn't there. My first thought was, she'd run away, grabbed what she could and ran away. But at that moment, my nostrils caught the smell of food cooking. The kitchen door slammed, and Miranda entered the room, wearing a sports coat that hung down to her knees. Good morning. Breakfast is ready. She smiled, standing on the floor barefoot. For some reason, I felt as cozy as I hadn't in six months. For a minute, it was like nothing had happened. I was back with my family. Now my wife would turn around, fix her bangs, and kiss me on the cheek, and my daughter Madonna would climb on my lap, laughing happily. But her indifferent face stood before my eyes, and the good mood immediately vanished. I pulled on my camouflage pants and went into the bathroom. I looked in the mirror at a not-yet-old, stubbly man with an army badge around his neck. Looking at this silver oval on a leather cord, hiding in the gray hair on his chest, I somehow thought that the war will not soon let me go. I ran my finger over my cheek. I should shave. Or not. I thought about it and decided to leave it at that. They say unshaven is in fashion. Today is going to be a big day and the most important thing for me would be meeting Vera. I splashed water on my face and scratched my hairy chest with pleasure. It was time to move out. I opened the door and saw Miranda standing behind it. Everything's getting cold. I had a breakfast of scrambled eggs and stew. I drank a glass of tea and kissed the woman on the cheek and went to get ready. I put on a t-shirt, a sweater, and a winter army jacket. Tying his boots, he said to Miranda. Stay home. Don't go anywhere. I'll take care of business and come back for you. We'll go buy you some clothes. The question that's been on my mind since last night came up. How did you get a key to this apartment? Miranda instantly blushed and turned away. I used to live here with my grandfather. What do you mean, lived? I got a bad feeling. Literally. The old owner was my grandfather. I lived with him for a year and a half, worked, looked after him. Everybody left him, no son or daughter to look after him. He had two heart attacks. He promised to sign the apartment over to me, but he didn't have time. The third heart attack killed him. Then his kids came and threw me out on the street. I lived at work for a while until they fired me, and then I left. Miranda spoke calmly, without emotion. It was obvious she had long since burned out. 
Okay, it's a long story. You can tell me later. I buttoned my jacket, checked the tactical knife on my hip. I didn't take it because I feared for my life. I just remembered my father's words. A man should have three things in his pocket, a knife, a handkerchief, and ten dollars. Strange. Why didn't my father include condoms in that list? The snowfall was over, the sky cleared, and the cold winter sun looked at me in a friendly way. I got into the cab I had ordered, gave the address. The ride was quick. It was Sunday, and the city was car-free. I got out of the car and stood in front of the entrance for a while. There was a black SUV about three meters away. Two people were sitting in the car, smoking with the window ajar. Two jets of blue smoke were rising upward. I went to the door. Everything seemed to be in order so far. I inserted the key and turned it carefully. The lock clicked and the door opened. Yesterday, when I left, I'd locked it two turns. So there's someone in the apartment. Not likely, Vera. She wasn't due until two hours later. I carefully opened the door and slipped into the apartment. I pressed myself against the wall and listened. The room was silent, only the clock in the hall ticking. I peered through the doorway. There was a man lying on the carpet, awkwardly tucked under his arm, face down. One shoe had slipped off his foot and lay orphaned a little apart from the rest of his body. It was obvious to the naked eye that he was long and securely dead and did not enliven the landscape at all. Rather, the opposite. One word pulsed in my head like a red fire, set up. I had to get out of here. I closed the front door quietly too and began wiping the doorknob with a handkerchief. I heard the approaching wail of a police siren. Makes sense. Downstairs, the door slammed and voices rang out. The elevator clicked and went down, counting down the floors obediently. I rushed upstairs. Luckily for me, the attic was open. It was only a matter of minutes before I jumped out onto the roof and ran to the exit at the last entrance. On the way, I grabbed a broom and a large red bucket from the wall. The entryway was quiet. I quickly rolled to the first floor and froze in front of the front door. Well, God be with you. I set the red bucket in front of me and stepped out onto the porch. There were two police cars on the right and a patrolman in a baggy, crumpled uniform with a machine gun. I turned slowly to the left when I heard stomping feet behind me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw two policemen rushing up the driveway. I rounded the corner, leaned my gear carefully against the wall, and walked to the bus stop. A few minutes later, I was hanging out like a sausage in a crowded cabin. Well, this is it. Whose setup is this? There was only one question on my mind. Obviously, there were cameras in the entryway. I helped install them myself in my former life, but my jacket had a good hood up to my eyes, and I turned my head away, just in time. I dialed Vera's number and moved the meeting to a place only we knew about. We were sitting at the table of a cozy coffee shop in an old, neglected city park. I loved this place. Sometimes on weekends, we would come here for ice cream. My wife was sitting across from me, and trying not to meet my gaze, she spoke softly. In the third year of medical school, Vera fell in love. Danilo was a law student at the university. He was tall, statuesque, with beautiful brown eyes, and she was a blue-eyed blonde with a gorgeous figure. They complimented and shaded each other's beauty. Their romance was growing. The lovers wanted to get married, but decided to finish university first. Danilo rented a one-room apartment in the city, and they began to live together. Vera did not notice anyone else. There was only one man for her, her Danilo. Their parents were aware of this relationship and asked only one thing, to delay with the child, to finish their studies and give birth to a son or daughter in a legitimate marriage. And so the final exams were passed. In the fall, Vera was waiting for internship. Danilo was going to leave for an internship in Rira in August. So they decided to schedule the wedding for July. Vera was in love euphoria on the eve of the wedding and was counting the days until the most important event in any woman's life. The wedding dress was already being sewn. The restaurant and tickets for the wedding trip were ordered. That night, they made love. And waking up in the morning, Vera did not find Danilo near her. 
she padded barefoot into the kitchen. Strange, he wasn't there. Maybe he's in the bathroom, not there either. She went back to the kitchen again. An uneasiness crept into her heart that was still unclear. Where is he? Maybe he ran to the store. And suddenly Vera saw a white square of paper lying on the table, pressed against an empty coffee cup. Faith sat down on a stool. I'm sorry, but I've fallen in love with someone else. Don't come looking for me. That's life. It happens. The letters began to sprawl, and Vera thought her heart had stopped. She wanted to scream, but she was short of breath. She stood up and tried to go to the window, but suddenly the floor shook and she lost consciousness. Vera took a long time to come to her senses, even wanted to kill herself. But she was young, and soon she met Enrique. He even looked something like Danilo. She plunged headlong into her new love, and three months later, they were married. Two weeks after the wedding, Danilo showed up in town. He said he was wrong, that he only loved Vera. He suggested that she leave her husband and go away with him. Vera had the sense not to be swayed by his exhortations. She did not leave her husband, but she could not resist her former lover. They slept together. Then Danilo left. And Vera found out a month later that she was pregnant. Enrique was overjoyed. A daughter, Madonna, was born. The husband adored his favorite girls. Enrique was a military man, and the family traveled with him through the garrisons. Finally, fate threw them back to their hometown. The husband's business trips were fewer, but those that were lasted a long time. Enrique started earning more money. Vera, too, had worked her way up, from an ordinary therapist in a district polyclinic to the head doctor of a medical center. Enrique only marveled at his wife's rapid career. Nothing had changed. They seemed to love each other even more. Then Danilo found Vera. He had grown older, turned it into a flamboyant, an imposing man. He transferred from the capital to the post of chairman of the regional court. His personal life did not work out, and he again began to seduce his former mistress. And Vera couldn't resist. No, she did not fall out of love with Enrique, after all, so many years together, but before the onslaught of the former could not resist. They started dating. Vera was torn between the two men, hesitating to give preference to one of them. And then something happened that Vera didn't expect. Danilo found out about Madonna and demanded a genetic test. The DNA test showed that he was her biological father. That solved everything. Vera was going to leave Enrique, but he left on another long business trip. A month later, Vera learned that he had died. There was no body, because after the explosion of the helicopter, there was nothing left. Fate had decided everything for her. Danilo brought her a paper from the military enlistment office that her heroic husband had died. Vera was saddened and in a week agreed to marry Danilo, having previously dissolved her marriage to Enrique. They told Madonna that her mother's old husband was not her father, and she wiped away her tears and snot and squealed with joy and rushed into Danilo's arms. Happy Danilo piled his favorite girls with gifts. He bought Madonna a car so that she did not remember her, as it turned out not her own father, who raised and loved her for almost 20 years. Money decided everything. Everything was wonderful. All were in chocolate, until there was not a live and nasty first husband. Faith stroked my arm and looked at me with inflamed eyes. Enrique, it was a mistake. I really believed you were dead. I even put a candle for your repose. I never thought it wasn't true. I had condolences from the military office. Danilo was in charge of all that. He even made a request to your unit. They confirmed everything, it was clear. Danilo had cut off all tails. Power and money had done their job. Love had nothing to do with it, especially Madonna, his daughter. The family is reunited and he's left with nothing. 20 years for nothing. She left me without a second thought, relieved that everything had worked itself out. Did she love me or did she just adapt? Who would know now? My thoughts circled in my head like a flock of gray crows, constantly returning to my daughter. 
Her betrayal was the thing that killed me the most. Yes, I spoiled their holiday, especially Madonna. I got up. All right, Vera, don't grieve. I won't appear on your horizon again. Live, breathe in two nostrils quietly, and I'll go on. Goodbye, Enrique, but I still love you. It just happened. I walked away like a man, without turning around. I walked down the street, oblivious to my surroundings. Pain and resentment were burning me from the inside out. After the wedding, Vera and I left for my duty station. I was quickly drawn into the rhythm of military life. I was appointed platoon commander of a regimental reconnaissance company, and I had almost no free time. I was in the unit for days on end. Vera sat without work, gradually turning from a nice girl into a complete bitch. People go crazy from idleness, especially young, untried women. After six months of service, at home, I was waiting for a woman who didn't love me. She clung to everything. To the unwashed plate, unevenly standing shoes, abandoned jacket. I tried my best to support my wife, realizing that it was not an easy time for her. Vera was already pregnant. I really hoped that with the arrival of the child, she would change for the better. And with hope looked at her already solidly rounded belly. Was I happy with her? I guess, yeah, she still loved me, despite everything. I still remember her hands clawing my back as my wife wriggled under my weight. After the birth of Madonna, our family life gradually began to improve. Vera was busy with her daughter all the time, and our relationship improved markedly. Sometimes, however, a chill ran between us. Vera started to shun me out of the blue, quickly averting her eyes when I spoke to her. I didn't worry about any of that nonsense, going headlong into the service and family problems. And there were a lot of them. Vera was so exhausted during the day that at night to get up to the child, she had no strength. I tried my best to help my wife. I fed my daughter at night, changed diapers, sometimes falling asleep in the kitchen from fatigue, dropping my head on the kitchen table. Over time, things got better. I gradually grew in positions and ranks. Faith went to work. Everything was normal. Then I was transferred to our hometown. And eight years later, that fateful business trip happened. At the end of the summer, our units were deployed as part of the peacekeeping force to Angola, a republic in the south of the African continent. A civil war had been raging there since the times of the Soviet Union, and our peacekeepers ensured the separation of the warring parties. For the first month, we corresponded with Vera. She told me news, wrote how her daughter was growing up. Then I was wounded. The flow of letters gradually dried up. There was mobile communication with the homeland, but our command did not welcome it. I lay in hospitals for almost six months until the Military Medical Commission recognized me, unfit for further service. I was discharged from the army, and I went home to my loving wife and daughter. And this is what happened. I was left alone. No wife, no daughter. Thank God I didn't need any money. I rubbed my palms together. Hey, stop squelching. Life goes on. What are my years? 42 is not a judgment. A man is like a fine wine. It only gets better with age. I raised my head. The sun seemed to shine brighter. My thoughts returned to the dead stranger in the apartment. Clearly, I was being set up. But who and why? How did you know I'd be in the apartment? Were you listening to my conversation with Vera? Why? Who did I step on so badly that they decided to put me behind bars? Maybe Danilo. I remembered his triumphant face at the corporate party. Maybe he's afraid of Vera coming back to me. But if he's a man, he must realize that's impossible. No matter what the circumstances, I will never take Vera back, no matter how much I love her. I just can't forgive betrayal. How about Madonna? It's more complicated. She's a daughter. She's not my daughter. She's his daughter. I couldn't get over the DNA test result. In fact, it's the reason Vera ran off with Danilo long before I left on my business trip. I patted my breast pocket. Then, with two fingers, I pulled out a small cellophane bag. In it, I kept my daughter's hair, cut off when she was a year old. All this time, I had kept it as an amulet. In my memory, 
She was forever that little girl, my daughter, whom I loved with all my heart. I stopped and stared at the strand of light blonde hair for a long time. Then I couldn't stand it and cried. The officer on duty at the city military enlistment office took a long time to look at my prescription, as if he had seen such a document for the first time. Then he gave me back the paper and directed me to the 16th office. I knocked on the shabby door and without waiting for an answer, went into the room. Behind the desk, I remembered, sat a major with a flabby face, wearing a wrinkled, greasy tunic. Wait in the hallway. My persona didn't even bother to look at him. I don't have much time, I just have to register. I walked over to the table and put the prescription on the edge. The major raised his piggy eyes at me and suddenly shouted in a falsetto, I don't understand, I told you to wait. I bent over the table, grabbed him by the lapel of his uniform and lifted him over the table. You have to stand up when you talk to the colonel. The major deflated, sniffled and covered his eyes as if he expected me to hit him. I gently returned the loose body to its place and with my index finger pushed the order to him. Colonel Rocky, discharged on account of a wound, I need to register with you. Yes, of course, one minute. The Major was slowly coming to his senses. Do you have identification? I handed him the green crusts. The Major looked at the prescription, then at the photo in the ID card. You told Rocky? He looked at me warily. Yes, Colonel Rocky. Is there something bothering you? Just sit down for a minute, I'll be right back. The Major jumped out of his chair and sprinted out the door. My cell phone beeped. I looked at the screen, another unfamiliar number. I'm listening. Enrique, Rocky. It was a melodious female voice. I'm calling from Attorney Hidalgo's office. My name is Samantha. Are you comfortable speaking? We've been looking for you for three months in connection with your father's will, even Roca. A will? What happened? I interrupted the girl. There was a pause. You didn't know? She said guiltily. Your father died three months ago. We've found all the people involved except you. The reading of the will is scheduled for tomorrow. Your presence is required. I was in shock. Three months ago, my father died, and I had no idea. We were very far apart. My father never recovered from my mother's betrayal and running away. It was as if he took his resentment of his runaway wife out on me, their son. Over time, he began to avoid me. The last time we met was at his wedding. He married a young woman almost half his age. Then I went to military school and finally lost touch with him. Where will the autopsy be held? I pulled myself together. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock sharp at Mr. Hidalgo's law office. But Pepe asks you to come early. Bring your ID or passport. Goodbye. Have a good day. The girl went out. I sat for a while, thinking about the will and my father's death. The door knocked and a panting major entered the office. Comrade Colonel, the commissar asks you to come and see him. Come on, I'll show you where his office is. We went up to the second floor and found ourselves in the reception area. When the receptionist saw us, she rose slowly and looked at me with surprised eyes. The major knocked politely and opened the door, letting me in. At the end of the long office, a gray-haired colonel sat behind a large desk when I entered, he stood up and came out to meet me. It's very good to see you, Enrique. He extended his hand in greeting and added, Laura, bring us some coffee. Then turned to the Major. You are free to go. The Major shuffled his feet, trying to reproduce the brave kick of his heels, turned over his left shoulder, and disappeared. Have a seat. The Colonel nodded at the two armchairs and seated himself at a massive coffee table covered with a white tablecloth. Noiselessly, the secretary came in and quickly arranged a plate of cut sausage on the white tablecloth, put an open jar of chicken pate next to it, put a finely sliced loaf, put an open bottle of vodka in a misted bottle and two glasses. Literate girl, I thought to myself. The military commissar poured the vodka. Welcome back, Colonel. He raised his glass and we clinked them together.
We drank and had a quick snack. Glad you're here. You know, there's been a lot of buzz around you. Like you died a hero's death. There's a guy who's been trying really hard. Even made a request for you. We sent one as soon as the funeral came in. His reply was earlier. He said it's true. That you were killed. I even went to your wife to offer my condolences. We got a reply to our inquiry that you're alive and not quite well. You've been sent back to the civilian labor force. It's a merry-go-round. You can't explain what's going on. If you need to formally apologize, I'll be there myself. The colonel poured a second one. I shrugged. It's okay. Don't worry. Everything has been explained to her. The commissioner caught something in my voice and looked at me understandingly. Well, here's to the fallen. The commissioner raised his glass. We drank without bumping. We sat and talked. We poured a third. The colonel got up and went to the table. He came back, clasping something in his palm. Here, I sent a man to the capital on purpose. He handed me the order, sunk in blue velvet. A conversation with the commissar confirmed Vera's words. Danilo wanted to bury me so badly that he even sent a request to my unit. I see, Judge, there are possibilities, especially with his own daughter and ex-lover at stake. I visited another place of worship and placed a rush order, paying triple the rate for speed. I had a question I wanted to ask, and I wanted to solve it as quickly as possible. I opened the door, and the aroma of freshly cooked food wafted to me. Miranda appeared from the kitchen. You're just in time. Lunch is ready. Her eyes shone with joy and pride. A complete illusion of family. I sighed, stripped off my clothes, and went to wash my hands. We took a cab through several boutiques. Miranda was terribly shy, but womanhood prevailed. I bought her winter boots, a warm jacket, a wool suit, a down scarf, and even a cocktail dress. But I didn't understand why. That's not counting the special feminine gizmos, the purpose of which was a mystery to me. Miranda's cheeks were even flushed with excitement. Then there was the beauty parlor, where I almost fell asleep waiting for my lady. To top it all off, we stopped at a restaurant and Miranda showed off her new dress to the world. The audience looked on in amazement at the strange couple an unshaven man in camouflage, and a young, glamorous lady. They didn't even want to let me in at first, but a good tip solved everything. I watched my companion out of the corner of my eye. She had two good manners for a bum. She ate beautifully, using cutlery expertly. When the lobster was served, she unmistakably chose the right tongs to cut it. Apparently this woman had lived a very different life in her time. I sat, savoring the tart wine, and discreetly looked around the hall. It was gradually filling up with the public. The noise level had risen, the effect of the drink. Finally, the shaggy musicians played something slow. The people cheered and stretched out on the dance floor. Let me invite you. A fidgety major drew up at our table. Miranda looked at me, and I read everything in her eyes. The girl doesn't dance. I smiled politely. No one's asking you, Uncle. The boy reached his hand toward Miranda. My husband explained everything to you. Miranda didn't even give Squint a glance. Okay, I'll be back. The unfulfilled bow began to drift slowly back to his table. Miranda looked at me pleadingly. Husband? She said I was her husband. I looked at my companion in surprise. She was terrified. The prospect of combat contact was clearly not inspiring to her. I, on the other hand, liked everything about it, even the threat of a fight. Testosterone was bubbling in my body and demanded an outlet. I poured myself a shot from a fogged decanter. The vodka rustled down my esophagus and landed softly in my stomach. Now the pickle. I even squeezed my eyes shut with pleasure. I'd never downed vodka and I didn't understand people who did. Women, I see. They put on a whole show when they drink vodka in the company of a man. The most important thing for a woman is not to show that she likes it. She's not like that. She'll wrinkle her nose, even let a tear fall. Choking on the overturned shot glass will immediately wash it down with water, or worse, some cola, demonstrating that the very process of drinking causes her disgust. 
but you should see how these young ladies drink without men. You can't drink vodka, only with appetizers, cucumber, mushrooms, or green tomatoes. I picked up a pickled pear with my fork, discreetly looking around the hall. Some movement at the entrance caught my attention. The maitre d' escorted the new guests to a vacant alcove. Yes, it's a small world. The first to his table, gracefully went Vera, followed by Madonna with a haughty look of the mistress of life. But I know Vera's current husband, but this is the first time I've seen a young botanist next to my former daughter. The four of them sat down at a table and began to study the menu. The waiter and the maitre d', who was glowing with joy, stood nearby waiting for their orders. It was clear that the judge and his companions were known, loved, and appreciated. Suddenly, I caught Vera's gaze. She saw me, and on her face was a gamut of feelings, from surprise to anger. It is clear that my young companion caused in her first of all jealousy. It's worse to see your ex in the company of a charming, and most importantly, young companion. Vera tilted her head and said something to Madonna. A moment later, both of them were staring at me. I don't know why, but I was in a bad mood. Can we go home now? I smiled at Miranda. Let's have coffee. It was obvious she didn't want to leave. I called the waitress. Bring coffee and count us in, please. The musicians started playing the slow song again. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a recent, wobbly major swaying toward the table where Vera was resting with her new family. He, smirking, approached Madonna and said something. Leaning over, she responded, and her answer clearly did not like the drunken bow. He roughly grabbed her arm and pulled her onto the dance floor. The nerd sitting with her started to object, but the major paid no attention to him, continuing to drag Madonna to dance. Danilo, who was sitting opposite her, got up from his seat and looked for the administrator, who had fallen through the ground. It was clear that the new dad himself was in no hurry to intervene in the emerging conflict. I felt uncomfortable. After all, she had been my daughter for almost twenty years. I intercepted Vera's pleading look. Sit down, I'll be right back. I finished my pickled mushroom, wiped my lips with a napkin, and headed toward the hotbed of conflict. The Major was dragging Madonna to the dance floor with donkey-like persistence. She looked back helplessly at the nerd who had lowered his head and Danilo, who was nervously talking on his cell phone. Madonna slightly freed herself and tried to take a step back. Then the insolent man grabbed her tighter, forcing her to stop. She tried to pull her elbow away, but he held it firmly. Stop. You can't get away from me. You'll have to dance. Without letting go of the girl, the fidgety one dragged her to the dance floor again. It was a good time to intervene. Young man, shame on you. Let the girl go now. There was hope on Madonna's face and surprise on the Major's face. I moved straight toward them, adjusting my glasses as I went. You see that, don't you? The girl doesn't want to dance. I tried to get closer. Leave her alone. You, I'll get you. The young man clearly lacked the words to express his indignation and frighten me at the same time. He let go of Madonna's hand and lowered his head and came at me like a bull at a rodeo. Well, that was easy. I took a step to the left, turning my body at the same time. The young fool's body torpedoed past me. He must have realized at the last moment that he was flying by, but he couldn't stop. A nimble footstep and the hooligan with all his might collapsed hitting his head with a characteristic thump, and the floor covered with marble tiles. After a couple of meters of inertia, the Major's head hit the Christmas tree in the middle of the hall and fell silent. Flight, said someone in the audience. Madonna looked at me, stunned. I turned to Vera and shrugged. Then I went back to my table, poured vodka, and drank it in one gulp. Pack up, we have to leave. I looked at Miranda. She nodded. The waitress came over, I paid quickly, and Mirananda and I walked out into the lobby. I was about to go outside to the cab waiting for us when a familiar voice sounded behind me. Enrique. I turned around. Vera had tears in her eyes. Thank you. She wanted to say something else, but I walked silently out the door. When I woke up, Miranda wasn't there. 
There was a towel-covered plate of sandwiches on the kitchen table, and the kettle was still hot on the stove. I looked in the bathroom, but my friend wasn't there either. I guess Miranda had left. I pulled out my wallet. My money and credit cards were still there, and my ID was still there. My cell phone beeped, picking up a text message. I looked at the glowing screen. The paralegal, Samantha, had texted me the address of Mr. Hidalgo's office. I looked at my watch. It was time to call a cab. But I couldn't get over Miranda's sudden disappearance. I'd go to the lawyer's office, and then I'd decide what to do. So as not to shock the honorable lawyer and the rest of the public, I shaved, put on a clean white shirt, black jacket, and jeans. At the specified time, I was in place. I thought I would be the first to arrive. But when, accompanied by the lawyer, we entered his office, decorated with a large Christmas tree, I saw a young, spectacular, brightly painted blonde. I'd like you to meet her. This is Carmelita, your father's wife. The Hidalgo, with the air of a social lion, introduced the maiden to me. Enrique Roca, even son. I shuffled my feet politely, and she nodded at me, nervously and carelessly, flicking ash into a large glass ashtray. There was an unfinished cup of coffee in front of her. I'd never met her before, but the last time I'd talked to my father on the phone, I knew he'd remarried. Where his old wife had gone, I didn't know. Can we get started? The vulgarly colored girl fidgeted impatiently in her chair. An unassuming man with a gray suit and a leather folder in his hands separated from the wall. We'll have to wait a little longer. Not everyone's here. He coughed and wiped his glasses, squinting his nearsighted eyes. I understood it was a notary. Does someone else have to come up or something? Carmelita looked around the room. As far as I know, there are two heirs. There are more heirs. The notary smiled strainedly. Without their presence, we can't open the will. His voice was firm, despite his shabby appearance. I realized at once that he was not as simple as he wanted to appear. A quote from the Samurai Code of Bushido came to mind. Show your enemies your pathetic nature, arouse their contempt for you, relax their minds and muscles, and then deliver one fatal blow. I pictured the notary in a kimono samurai with a sword in his hands and even shuddered. But it looked pretty good. The door opened and a very beautiful woman in a strict business suit and a fancy hat entered the office. This is Mrs. Violetta Bermont, Mr. Rocky's first wife. The lawyer bent in a half bow and pushed back his chair, inviting the lady to sit down. I sat and looked at the woman in silence. Is that my mother? After all these years, she's here to divide her ex-husband's inheritance? So that's the surprise my lawyer told me about before the event started. But the notary was in no hurry to start and looked at his watch several times. We were waiting for someone else. Thoughts were racing through my head at breakneck speed. I had so many questions that my brain was unable to deal with the emotions that came up. But I tried to pull myself together. Carmelita, too, was looking from me to her mother in bewilderment. Mrs. Bermont seemed to be the only one who remained unperturbed. She nodded curtly to the notary and the lawyer. "'What are we waiting for, gentlemen? Start already,' she said, not paying the slightest attention to me. "'Just a moment. Not everyone is here yet.' Hidalgo stared tensely at the front door. It creaked, and Miranda came into the office. She took a seat in the chair she'd obligingly moved, still staring at me, stunned. Then she quickly averted her eyes, as if she'd put an insurmountable barrier between us. Frankly, I was stunned myself. Too many surprises today. The lawyer breathed a sigh of relief. Well, we're all assembled. We can begin. He nodded to the notary. He sat down in his chair and opened the folder. Gentlemen heirs, the will was made by the late Ivan a month before his death. There are no other documents concerning the inheritance. He read out the preamble and went on to the essence of the will, all movable and immovable property belonging to me. Then went on to list everything that belonged to my father. I leave to my last wife, Carmelita Rocky. You could hear Carmelita squealing with happiness. Five thousand dollars. 
In my bank account, I leave to my first wife, Violet Berman, and my daughter Miranda in equal shares, that is, two and a half thousand dollars each. At these words, Miranda shuddered. I disinherit my son, Rocky Enrique. Next came the enumeration of the officials in whose presence the will had been made. There was a pause. Everyone stared at Miranda and me stunned. It was as if I'd fallen down a deep well. I looked up. Miranda was looking at me with the exact same look. The wool from the lousy sheep, my mother said angrily, rising from her chair without so much as a glance at me. The others came up too. Carmelita didn't hide her joy, glancing triumphantly at Miranda and me. One moment, gentlemen. Counsel is back on the stand. There are some more nuances. He looked at the folder on the table and nodded to the notary. The thing is that six months ago, Mr. Rocky donated his property, including the construction company, to Mrs. Milagros. If Carmelita would object and try to challenge that decision in court, he asked that this be attached to her. The lawyer handed Carmelita an envelope with photographs. Carmelita snatched it out of the lawyer's hands and looked at the contents. You could see from her face that she was in shock. One photo fell out of her hands and onto the floor. I managed to see that it showed a half-naked Carmelita in the arms of some swarthy macho man. I caught Miranda's cold and lifelessly detached gaze. Without saying a word, she left the lawyer's office so quickly that I didn't even have time to come up to her and congratulate her on the sudden wealth that had fallen on her head. I thought she was waiting for me at the entrance to the building, but she wasn't there. I wondered what made her disappear so quickly without a word to me. Maybe I thought too much of myself. After one night, mother disappeared without a word to me too. Well, I didn't expect anything special so my father's decision didn't make me despair. I've got arms and legs. I'm still healthy. I've lived before without a lot of money, and I'll live now. Life is a strange thing. It changes people before your eyes. Yesterday, I had a woman with me, who, of course, I was attached to with all my heart. As fate would have it, when she became a rich, promising lady, she left me in cold blood, tossing me aside like a used gasket. Even Carmelita had some sympathy for me. She touched me on the elbow. Come on, let's go have a drink air. Celebrate, so to speak. She grinned bitterly. I refused. I walked down the park's alley, kicking at the December snow that had not yet accumulated. The wind blew into my face, smearing snow dust on my cheeks. It turned into drops of water that looked like tears when they hit my burning cheeks. Apparently, along with the wind, I was saddened by the things I could never get back. My cell phone rang. I read the text message. My order is ready. You can pick it up anytime. I stared at the yellow envelope made of heavy paper for a long time, then I carefully trimmed the edge. Well, basically, just as I'd hoped. At that moment, my cell phone vibrated in my pocket. Vera. She was getting in my way a lot. Enrique, don't hang up. We need to meet right away. She was almost yelling. You can come to our cafe. I walked over to the table where Vera was sitting, not knowing where to put my hands. She looked like the beautiful and sensual woman she was. When she saw me, she even stood up. You said you wanted to talk. Struck by my callousness and brevity, Vera looked at me in surprise. What's wrong? I looked around for the waitress. They arrested Danilo. I don't know what to do. Vera was almost sobbing. Calm down and tell me more. At least there's some good news, I thought to myself. He was arrested right in his office. He had not been charged yet, but something to do with murder and gold smuggling. Vera told me through sobs. What should I do? It's hard for me to say anything about it. He's your husband and Madonna's father. You're going to carry his packages to prison. Vera looked at me in horror. I was sitting in front of a woman I'd once loved like no other, until she broke my heart. What did you want? I don't have to help you. You made your choice. I knew I was being cruel, but I couldn't help myself. I would never have left you if it hadn't been for Madonna. 
Vera looked at me through her tears. I wanted the girl to have a real father. She was silent, realizing what a stupid thing she'd said, and I realized where she was going with it. Well, you've done it. Madonna has her own father now. All we have to do is wait for him to come home from prison. She looked me in the eye. I knew she was trying to tell from my eyes what mood I was in. She'd done it before. I miss you. I want to have what we used to have. I love you. I need you, Vera said pleadingly. You didn't need me when you were with him. How can you say you love me when you lied to me and messed with my head? For the last year of our marriage, you slept with him and you loved him. Vera sensed the contempt in my voice. Your love affair began before my business trip, and then you found out I was dead. You didn't need documents about my death. You took your lover's word for it. I continued. You were relieved that everything had resolved itself. Lowering her heat in shame, she said, I'm so sorry. I was thinking. I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I wasn't thinking at all. Raising her head and looking at me with tear-filled eyes, she added, I'm so sorry. If it hadn't been for Madonna, I would never have left you. I stared at the crying woman in silence. Once my heart would have melted at her tears. But now I felt nothing but boiling anger with no compassion. Enrique, let's give it all back. After you came here, I can't live in peace. I really love you. Only you. No one else. Please. I made a mistake. Just take me back. Apparently my silence gave Vera some hope. You did all this for your daughter, didn't you? To reunite the family? And the fact that I spent 20 years raising her wasn't a deal-breaker for you. I've seen how my daughter feels about me. You did a good job of re-educating her. Shaking my head, I stood up. You brought this on yourself. Now take a full spoonful. I spoke calmly, almost impassively. As for Madonna, read this. I put the unfolded document in front of Vera. She read the paper, and her face seemed to swim. Oh my god, it couldn't be. She was in shock. Maybe your lover cheated you here too. With his connections, it's easy to fake a DNA test. Madonna was my daughter, biologically and in life. Goodbye. Wait. Please, she began. We have nothing to wait for. You've made your choice. We're done. Go back to him. Go back to your husband, I said, and headed out of the cafe. In the evening, my mother came to see me. She stood on the poorly lit landing and looked at me. The same wide-brimmed hat covered her face, so I couldn't see the expression in her eyes. Can I come in? She asked in a slightly husky voice. I stepped aside. Who gave you my address? I closed the door. Counselor, you wrote it down when you filled out the form. She took off her boots, hung up her coat and hat, noped the nailed hanger, and walked into the room. Is this your apartment? My mother asked, or stated it as fact, and looked around the modestly furnished living room. No, I'm taking it off temporarily. I was surprised to note that my mother's visit did not arouse any emotions in me. Where do you live? My mother asked. I don't know yet. No plans for the future yet. Are you married? Was recently divorced. Why? I thought my mother looked sympathetically at me. I remained silent. I didn't feel like revealing my soul to a stranger. For some reason, our conversation reminded me of a conversation in the personnel department. Short questions and short answers. I realize that you can't feel anything but hatred for me. But believe me, there hasn't been a day that I haven't thought about you. Your father was a terrible man. I only had to endure that hell for a year and a half. Yes, I left you when you were very young, but believe me, I had no other choice. The mother held her handkerchief to her eyes, wiping or pretending to wipe away her tears. There was a pause. Mother sobbed a few times. It looked like she was really crying. Is she still capable of it? He invited me to the reading of the will, Mother continued. I haven't had any relations with Ivan since I left. Suddenly there was a will, and money too. She smiled sadly. Enrique, you don't know everything. Before I got married, I was dating a guy named Sergio. 
We were getting married. We'd already bought the rings. But then Ivan intervened. I don't know how he persuaded or maybe forced Sergio to give me up. And my lover left me, not knowing I was pregnant. A month later, I married Ivan. And eight months later, I gave birth to you. You were so small, only two six hundred. I was so afraid you'd slip out of the midwife's arms and fall to the floor. God, how happy I was then. For almost a year and a half, we lived more or less tolerably well. And then Ivan started looking at you, trying to find a resemblance to himself. He got the idea that you weren't his son. He took a DNA test, and it all came out. That night, he beat me up. He screamed that I was a bitch and a whore. A cuckoo who'd slipped him a fetal bastard. Ivan took away all my jewelry, even my wedding ring. He beat me almost every day, and I couldn't take it. One day when he was at work, I kissed you one last time, and I left. I couldn't take you with me because I was going nowhere. I had some money, I bought a ticket and went to Madrid. My third aunt lived there. I could hardly find her, and on my knees, I begged her not to throw me out on the street. She took pity on me, let me live there. She got me a job as a waitress in a cafe. That's where I met Ahmed. He was studying in Moscow, and this year he was taking his final exams. Ahmed started courting me. They know how to turn naive fools' heads. He promised to marry me, suggested that I go to his parents in Egypt. I agreed, falling for his stories of a beautiful life. But instead of meeting his parents and getting married, I ended up in a brothel. My mother covered her face with her hands and burst into tears. For three years, I was in hell. I accepted my fate as payback for abandoning my child. I worked all day long, on sheets wet with sweat, unable even to wash myself. Once a day, a bucket of water was brought into a small pencil room, fenced off with blankets so I could wash up a little. And again it went on and on. It was a German, Peter Bermond, who got me out of there. I don't know how he managed to buy me out of slavery. He took me to Germany. He offered to take me back home. But I flatly refused. I was afraid I'd ruin your life. A few years later, I married Peter. But we never had children. The years I spent in the brothel and the several abortions I had. After almost ten years, I came to our town. I saw you. What did it take for me to keep from running up to you to hold you to my chest? I often watched you from the sidelines. I met your grandmother in secret, gave her the money, and begged her not to tell anyone I was here. And then your grandmother died, you left, and I lost you. Today when I saw you, my heart beat so hard I thought its pounding would be heard by everyone. I know you can never forgive me, but I had to tell you all this. Where is your husband now? I poured water into a glass and handed it to my mother. He died a year ago. I live alone now. He left me some money, and I have enough. His adult children treat me well, even come to visit. I went to the window. Everything became clear to me. Ivan was not my father. That's why he treated me so coldly and finally disinherited me. Yeah, that's a twist. It's like Santa Barbara. So Miranda's not my sister, either. My mother stood up. She took a bag out of her purse and put it on the coffee table. Here's the money. Take it, please. I stared at her in silence, trying to look into her eyes. Is this some sort of compensation for the lack of maternal affection? I smirked. She flinched as if she'd been hit, then shrank back, and with her head down, went into the hallway. I didn't go to see her off. On the threshold she turned around tears were streaming from her eyes. I'm sorry, son. She whispered the words almost silently and went to the front door. Had I forgiven her? To be honest, I didn't know. One thing was clear. I had loved her all along, even though I could never remember her face. And then something inside me snapped. I suddenly felt like the little boy who'd been abandoned by his mother once before. Mom. It was hard for me to speak. Spasms choked my throat. Tears streamed from my eyes until my mother's warm hand pressed my head against my chest. The day before the new year, the thaw was replaced by a real frost. It snowed lightly at night, and in the morning the sidewalk and trees looked as if they were sprinkled with powdered sugar. I walked up to the two-story mansion, lost in the depths of the snow-covered park. 
I walked up the frost-covered steps, careful not to slip. It was early, and the janitor had not yet had time to clean and sand and salt them. As soon as I got to the porch, the door swung open, as if I had been expected. Who do you want? The sleepy maid asked unhappily, pressing her palm to her mouth, trying to hide a yawn. Good morning, I'm looking for Miranda. The landlady is still asleep, and she didn't tell me to disturb her. Tell the hostess that Enrique Rocky wants to see her. Without a word, the maid closed the door in my face. Well, let's wait. I lit a cigarette, inhaling it deeply, along with the frosty air. The door opened. It was the same maid. The landlady said she didn't know anyone by that name. Leave or I'll call security. I thought I saw the figure of a half-naked young man flicker behind her back. Well, I already knew how easily and thoughtlessly cruel it was for women to sever old ties. Yesterday she was still in love. But today the situation had changed and she had stepped over me. I took off my glove and extended my palm. The snowflakes fell into her palm, tentatively, as if afraid of something, melting immediately. Like my fleeting hope for simple human happiness had just melted away. Everything around me was white. Only the fluttering bullfinches, bright red spots, enlivened the dull white landscape. One should never cling to the past. And at that moment, my cell phone came to life. Enrique? An unfamiliar male voice asked from the phone. I have a proposition for you. Be at the Plaza Hotel restaurant tonight at 7 p.m. I know you, so I'll come myself. It was just three days of my not very long life so far. A small episode, but not eventful. What lay ahead, I did not know. But time heals wounds. When fate closes a door in front of you, it opens another. The main thing is not to lose heart and find it. I managed to find and open that door.